it's not the end of the world. A lot of this is about the journey, and uh, I know that's not my set, my line or anything like that. I know people have said it before me, but uh, all you can do is prepare your best and and uh, and lay it all out there. There's there's uh, I'm sure people that that have won championships that haven't had to work very hard at it, and uh, we've worked very hard and haven't done it, and and yet I feel a lot of reward out of the effort that it took to uh, to compete for that. John Stockton, we all have different memories, we all have a different image. Good evening, everybody. And for the next hour, we're going to explore John Stockton as much as, well, he's allowed us to over his very private and public at the same time career. And with me, two individuals who have unique perspective. First of all, Larry Miller, who's the owner of the Utah Jazz, who's had the pleasure of his company professionally and, and privately. And Jeff Hornacek, who has the unique perspective of viewing him both as an opponent and then as a teammate and I'm sure that uh, the emotions were 180 degrees opposite as those two situations were as well. Also we had anticipated, for those of you who uh, had anticipated Carl Malone joining us tonight, apparently that was not to be. It has been an emotional weekend and uh, Larry that's not going to be able to be achieved tonight. Well it's really not. I got a hold of Carl yesterday and asked, uh, I said Carl you need to be on this show because you've been such a part of, uh, of John's career and he of yours. Uh, so would you be willing to do it? And, and his first reaction was, I'd, I'd love to. And as he's had a chance to think about it over 24 hours, he's just uh, still kind of having uh, struggles sorting his feelings out about it and so on and felt that he probably would serve both John and himself well by not being here. So we'll hope that that all gets worked out in the next few well, He will be missed tonight, yeah. but uh, nevertheless, we will plot on because we have a great hour in store for you. And perhaps to set the scene, we should go back to 2.57. I remember the moment on Friday afternoon when John Stockton emerged from the Delta Center and from the meeting with Larry Miller and surprised all of us, I think. Maybe not with what was said or what was not said, but certainly the timing of it. I think I'm finished. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I, told, I informed those guys, and, and that's the direction I'm headed. So. And with that, that was about as definitive as it got, guys. But uh, and I know both of you, you obviously knew ahead of time, Larry. Uh, Jeff, you knew later uh, because you were not there when it was announced either as well. Did the timing surprise either one of you or both of you? It surprised me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think uh, uh, he probably was thinking about it, and I thought if he did re decide to retire, it was going to be maybe in a couple weeks after he thought about it. So uh, I actually got a call on the phone co in, in the car on the phone uh, saying, did you hear that John retired? And I had his daughter in the car. I had to turn around and say, well, did your dad announce something today? And she shook her head, yeah. So uh, that, that's when I found out, and I was, I was surprised. Maybe not that he was retiring, but that it was so soon. Well, I, on, on that morning, uh, Friday morning, he called me in my car and said, uh, can you and I get together? That's not a particularly unusual request because four, five, six times a year I'll get that call, but can we meet in the next week or I have this project I'm working on I want your advice on, something like that. So I said, uh, sure, when, we, when were you thinking? He says, right now. So I said, uh, how far are you from, from my office? And he said, about 10 minutes. I said, that's about what I am, I'll meet you there. So I got there, I said to Marilyn, John's going to be coming in uh, any moment, and I'll just uh, keep the decks clear until he gets here. And it wasn't but five minutes he came in and, and sat down. It was a little after quarter after nine. 
and we had uh, it was kind of the how's the weather, how's the family kind of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, and, and he said, well, I'm just going to lay it right out. I'm thinking of retiring. And I said, okay, and do you want to talk about it a little bit? And he says, yeah. And he says, but he said something really interesting, Steve. He said, and I didn't understand it the first time he said it. He said, I, I'm going to talk to about five people. Uh, my dad, Carl, Kevin O'Connor, Jerry Sloan, and yourself, and I want to see if you guys can talk me out of it. And any of you can talk me out of it. And I, and I didn't understand what he meant by that. He wasn't asking to be, well, we need you, we want you kind of thing. He said, I, I, as we went on in the conversation, he said, I've really thought through this. It's not a spur of the moment thing. I know it looks like it. But I think I've included all the elements in the equation that I should. So I want to see if any of you, whose judgment I trust, uh, can think of something that I've overlooked so that before I go full-blown public with it uh, and cast it in concrete that I should reconsider my decision. After, by the time we, we spent an hour and a half, by the time we got done, he had said to me three times, it's just time. And I said, I agree with you. Well, let's go back because that was the end, obviously, on Friday to the career. But let's go back to the beginning of this thing and uh, the surprise, I guess, on, in a lot of quarters that John Stockton was taken by the Utah Jazz because there were many in the country who said, who is this guy? Well, at Gonzaga University, they obviously knew who he was and John knew what he wanted when he came to the NBA. I'd like to say that I'm very excited at the possibility of playing with the Utah Jazz. And I'm very thankful to everybody here at Gonzaga, the play some players back here, the coaches, the staff. The sounds of it, I think that, that they're looking for a point guard to back up Ricky Green. He was an all-star player last year, and uh, he played a lot of minutes, and it, it might have cut down on his performance a little bit towards the end of the year because he had to play so many minutes, and over an 82-game schedule, that's difficult. So I think they're looking for a backup guy that can... Uh, play a few minutes and, and keep him in the game while he's out. Yeah, that's what you got. You got a pretty good backup guy played a few minutes in spelling Ricky Green. Boy, he looked like a young pup, <laughs> didn't he? That's, that was great. That's, uh, that's good footage right there. You know what amazes me is when John was announced as the, uh, as the selection, uh, the booze in, in the uh, Old Salt Palace that, you know, went, that accompanied it, but I can't find anybody who will fess up that they booed. It's like when Richard Nixon was, you know, was right. disgraced at Watergate. Right. They said, well, I didn't vote for him. Well, nobody booed, apparently, John Stockton. So I just, uh, you know, I wonder who those people are. They all moved or died or whatever. But, but it was not a popular selection. Yep, it, it really wasn't. And that's the first one in the series, I think, that led Frank to comment every draft year, Frank Layden, to say, well, if they, if they uh, boo us, we're okay. If they applaud the, cha the choice, we're in trouble. Uh, Luther Wright got, got applauded, for example. Well, it's probably good to have that, that juxtapositioning. All right, well, let's go back to June 19, 1984. The Utah Jazz did select what was regarded a small, skinny point guard from Gonzaga with the 16th pick in that NBA draft, and little did anybody know that the franchise would never be the same. Never, ever in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be playing professional basketball. When I was a projected fourth or fifth round pick uh, during, this, during my season at Gonzaga, and so I, again, I was just looking for a possibility of a tryout, and then one thing happened after another, and all of a sudden comes draft day, and I, I've heard that maybe, maybe a possibility late in the first round or second round, so because of that, we all watched the TV that day. A bunch of people came over to the house. The Utah's turn came, I said, watch out for Utah. The Utah Jazz select John Stockton of Gonzaga University. Hearing that on the TV set, I just walked out in the other room. I didn't, I didn't really quite know how to act. I, it was uh, a surprise, and, and, and yet it was uh, a challenge. It was a lot of things. I think people didn't know who he was, so there was shock and surprise. And I have to, I have to say this. I was not fully convinced it was the right thing to do. When we drafted him, we drafted him primarily as a backup to Ricky Green, who uh, was an all-star point guard and, and, and quite a great player in his own rights. We thought he had some physical talent, uh, but we didn't know what was in here and we didn't know what was in here. We were getting a highly intelligent, very competitive uh, player. I never thought there'd be a second season. I just knew that if I was called on, I better be ready to go in and I just kind of zeroed in on that. Um, and it made it real simple. I didn't, I didn't have any outside things that could distract me. I just had one thing, and that was to, to try to play well. This was my one shot. I went into camp, and I remembered uh, knowing who everybody was, and, and uh, strangely enough, I remembered calling, calling an old coach at home and saying, hey, they're not that good. Ricky Green was one of the first 
people that came and told me. He says, uh, Coach, he says, uh, this is a good one. And he said, he's something special. There was never any question about his ability to play. The biggest question mark that we had was would he hold up. <laughs> and a little did we know that he'd hold up as well as he has and played as long as he has. And John's parents have enjoyed every minute of it. I can remember when John was a rookie in sec first and second year, my wife used to get in our old Oldsmobile station wagon. If we drove over here about six blocks and pointed the, the car toward Salt Lake City, we could get hot rod. And uh, he'd fade in and fade out, and we'd sit out there in that car, just tickled to death to be able to listen to it, because the jazz were never broadcast up here. Little did Jack know that it wasn't the reception that got Hot Rod to fade in and fade out. He's been doing that for a long time. <laughs> hey, Jeff, talk to me then about playing against John in those early years. Um, Stockton and Malone, the, the uh, twosome, I said at the start, I would imagine that your feelings for John towards John changed significantly from opponent to teammate. What about as an opponent? Couldn't stand him. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, he's one of those guys that when you went out there and played against, you knew it was a battle. Um, I think when you're undersized and you're not expected to, you know, be one of these guys who gets all the calls, you learn to do little things. And John, John knew exactly how to get open, how to drive by you. Uh, I said for years that John was, even before I played with him, he was the best I've ever seen at getting over a pick and roll, uh, a screen. It, I was terrible at it. Now, we used to laugh in, uh, in Phoenix with Kevin Johnson. So I never seen a guy, when a guy goes to set a pick, his ability to get over that pick was better than anybody I've ever seen. And that was something I don't, I'm not sure it's ever been talked about, but uh, that was one thing I know. And one thing we saw earlier on that tape, which I doubt John had ever admitted something like that, but when he said the comment, uh, I called one of my coaches and said, these guys aren't that good. I can guarantee in that first year when he stepped on the court, he wasn't thinking he was going to be a backup. He was saying, I'm going to be a starter on this team. And I'm not sure if he will ever say that, but <laughs> that's the type of competitor he was. And I know that was probably going through his mind back then that I'm going to be a starter on this team. Well, he hasn't had a lot of things that didn't go his way over the years. Obviously, the 97-98 uh, the finals didn't. But one of the things that didn't go his way was 1984. And we will come back. We'll talk more about that as our hour progresses as we look back on the career of John Stockton. I, I can remember there's some nuns that live right behind us down there. And one nun came by one night, and he's out there with uh, cotton gloves on shooting free throws in the snow. And the nun came up and said, he's going to be something someday. The first time I met John was we both got cut from the Olympic team uh, in 84. We rode to the airport together. It was kind of weird because it was me, uh, Carl Malone, uh, Terry Porter. And you think like, wow. And then you see how his career turned out. Well, that was one of the first disappointments, or maybe one of the only disappointments of John Stockton's career. But guys, uh, that was probably the first pairing of John Stockton and Carl Malone in a car with Terry Porter and Charles Barkley. Go figure that one. It's an interesting group, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't make the 84 team, but obviously he did make a couple of dream teams. And that's when the dream team truly was a dream team. You had Michael Jordan, uh, Barkley was on that, and of course John and Carl. And, you know, not only for the individual but the honor of representing your country, especially on that, on that dream team, had to be something special. Larry, from an organizational standpoint, to have two guys that were there from the Utah Jazz. Yeah, it just, I, I, but you say that about John and Carl all the way along, is, is how fortunate we were to have, have two guys like that that have those great careers parallel and on one team and be able to represent them. And I don't mean to embarrass Jeff, but for seven years, he was part of a, what then became a triangle or a triumvirate. And, and I just can't even imagine ever having that again. Well, and of course, in Barcelona, uh, we had an opportunity to see John, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, his sense of humor. But in Barcelona, he wore a microphone and took a camera, a whole video camera around for NBA entertainment. And it provided some pretty interesting moments for the viewer. At Barcelona, the Utah point guard had little trouble escaping the spotlight that followed most of his high-profile teammates. In fact, the six-time All-Star's appearance in public was so ordinary, he easily passed for an average tourist and hardly a member of the greatest Olympic basketball team ever. Really not much different from Michael Jordan walking through here. Hi. Hi. Are you an American? Well, of course. You look wonderful. Why, thank you. You like the dream team, huh? Of course. Yeah, we met Charles Barkley the other night. Did you? He's a hell of a player. I see you got all the players right there on your yeah. shirt. Is Charles the only one you've ever seen? The only one I've ever met. Hey, guys, do you know any of those guys on there? Where? Who? Who's that? That's my dad. That's your dad? Too bad he's not here. 
I do, yeah. We're making a point that nobody ever recognized you. I hate this. I can't go anywhere without being bugged. I'm not a real exciting player, I don't think. I try to get the job done, but I guess I don't have much flair, which that doesn't bother me. It doesn't really bother me if uh, uh, people don't want to uh, do interviews or whatever. So uh, I, I'm pretty much going to go on about life and, and be happy just going home and playing with the kids. Well, I, I, and that is, that is John, but you know, uh, the sense of humor. I had a guy ask me the other day, he said, does John Stockton ever smile? He said, because besides a couple of game-winning baskets, I never see any smile out of this guy. Uh, he couldn't be further from the truth, could, be, could he? Because this guy, John Stockton, has a sense of humor that if you turn your back on him for a minute, <laughs> you're in trouble. Well, he was always entertaining on the bus, bus rides, plane rides. Uh, uh, it goes all the way to, we took our eighth graders last year on a retreat, and the parents had to put a little skit on, and, and John imitated the, uh, uh, the, the parish priest a little bit, too. So, uh, <laughs> no, you, you, don't, you see him on the court, how serious he is, how he likes to uh, uh, just compete and get after it, but then off the court, uh, he's a jokester like, you know, no one, no one really knows about. See, Larry, tr uh, truly nothing is sacred then with John, I guess. Well, if he's doing the parish priest uh, no, invitation. It's, <laughs> it's really not, but, you know, and there's a lot of instances, but, but he loves to win, as we all know, so he smiles a lot in the locker room after, but, but the one thing that popped into my mind about it was about uh, six or seven years ago, before we went to full chartering, he was, he was back in the getting his ankles iced after a game with Carl, the, just the two of them there, and I was there with him, but they were playing like I wasn't, and he's there, this is the kind of stuff Jeff alludes to, he says, Carl, how many more years do you think we could play if we if we chartered all the flights? And Carl says, oh, I don't know, probably another 10 or 12, but John says, I think it'd be 15 easy, <laughs> so he's back there goading me to, to charter the, the flights, which we did the next year, by the you way. You know, this year we got a glimpse of it, and I, and I don't know the game, I think it was the Toronto game, but Matt Harpering had fouled out. It was a Knicks game. Matt Harpering had fouled out, and he's on the bench, and he was, I mean, Matt Harpering has got, look at the stoic face. He's ticked. And look, look at John. And they're just trying to, they're trying to get him to lighten up. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not working. I mean, it, it absolutely isn't working. Harpering's explaining that um, I didn't commit the foul. I didn't, honest, I didn't commit the foul. <laughs> so, uh, but that's the John Stockton that we rarely ever got a glimpse of, but you guys did, uh, certainly as an owner and as a teammate, Horny. That's, I mean, that's John, right? You're just not going to, you're not going to leave any scab unpicked. No, um, you know, that, that was pretty funny watching that with Matt, but uh, uh, he did that throughout the, you know, six and a half years I was here, and uh, uh, he was, he was the quiet team leader in, in terms of uh, keeping everyone kind of on their toes, and uh, keeping everything, uh, you know, kind of that light feeling when you're off the court. But he was also the little stiletto. He was the knife that went in under the radar. Now, as a stand-up comedian, I'll tell you, this is a rare piece of tape, but you've got to watch this. I don't know that John wants to quit. I would say his day job or his night job now, but he doesn't have one. But if he's going to the comedy club, he's going to have to polish his routine. This is from, well, it's a few years ago, as you'll see by the audience, but this is John Stockton's stand-up routine. I remember one time we were playing the Celtics down at BYU, and uh, it was some kind of game. The Celtics were really working us over, and Larry Bird was playing a well of a game, and I think some of the guys out here remember him coming into the locker room. He stormed in there and just started pointing at guys. Dantley, you're making a million a year. Griffith, you're making 500,000, 300,000, 600,000. What's Larry Bird worth? 18 million, 20 million? He's kicking our butts. <laughs> he was trying to motivate us. We were down by 20, so we went out and lost by 30. <laughs> so uh, he, I mean, the guy just succeeds at whatever he does. That was a roast of Frank a long time ago. But uh, but John, you got a, a glimpse again of the sense of humor. Now, of course, Frank uh, retired as the coach, and Jerry Sloan took over. And what has John Stockton meant to Jerry Sloan? Well, it's probably hard to synthesize, but we talked to Jerry, and he had some comments and some reflections on John's career. Well, Coach, you joined the Utah Jazz coaching staff in 1984, which just happened to be John Stockton's rookie year. So you coached him as an assistant coach or a head coach for his entire career. So Friday afternoon when he came into your office to tell you that he was done, he was retiring, what was that like? Well, it was... Uh... It was kind of like John, to be honest about it. He came in and said, he wanted to talk to him, and he was real upbeat about it. And 
I kind of figured something was up because uh, he very seldom ever talked to me in the prior meeting that he just had, we're getting ready to have, and uh, he just said that uh, I think I've had it. And uh, uh, he mentioned a couple other things and uh, decided that uh, he should go on and, uh, and uh, not play anymore. What was your first impression of John back in 1984? Couldn't hold up. It's a bad one. <laughs> It's a bad impression to think back. Frank and I both said, could this guy hold up and play 48 minutes uh, in the NBA on a consistent basis because he, he looked like he uh, probably might not be able to. Ricky Green was ahead of him, wasn't much bigger and was much more physical than John at that particular time, but, uh, you know, they're just, they're just one of the things that uh, you thought about and wondered about him, but he and that heart never broke a sweat. <laughs> what amazed you the most about John? And throughout his career? Probably the thing that was his ability to concentrate. I mean, he's unbelievable, had an unbelievable knack of being able to. It always amazed me that you'd tell him what to do and he never asked, what are we doing? You know, he would be someone that everybody would run to and ask John, so what are we doing? Is there a memory or two that stands out for you from his career? Just about every day there was something that, that stands out with John because of his whether it became at the end of his career, whenever he knew it was difficult for him to go out there and play, and he could go out there and try to rev himself up and say to himself, I'm going to have a good practice today, some way, somehow, even knowing that uh, he probably didn't need to work. And early part of the stage is the way he would uh, go out there and try to play and try to do everything in the world. And I, I always said, to, you know, he never played the game backwards. Every single play, he seemed to be headed forward. If he made a mistake, uh, somebody beat him, he would always, it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect his uh, demeanor out there on the floor. He'd just keep coming at you and uh, you'd have to cut his uh, uh, arms and legs off to keep him from doing that. What's John's legacy to the game of basketball, do you feel? Well, it'll be interesting to see uh, how people recognize John. I, I, I just think he's, uh, hope he's recognized one of the uh, great guards to ever play this game because of his dedication what the game means to him, how he's approached the game every day. That probably is, a, I'd say those things are what he's all about. Well, it's a guy who spent a lot of time with him, and uh, he's probably right. Uh, you know, you look at the, the work ethic, and, and, you know, I don't think we have any concept, Jeff, of, of what you guys go through on a daily basis. We see you play 82 games a night, and, you know, and we see big salaries, and we see, you know, all the trappings that go with it, but uh, practice is where it's really done, I guess, and you know, to come out and practice when you guys reach a certain level in your career and be able to put out is, is pretty unique. I think that's where coaches see the guys that stand out. Uh, there are guys that might be a little bit better in games than they are in practices. Occasionally you get that guy. A lot of times the guys are better in practice than the games, um, but John played practice just like it was a game. Uh, we were talking the other day on uh, was one of the practices, I think it was after game two against Sacramento, and they had a uh, uh, practice and they had a little six minute scrimmage and Carl with his back, he was out of the practice and the starting group, I think they were down by about 12 points with two minutes to go in this little scrimmage, it was like 17 to five. And all of a sudden John comes down, shoots a three, comes down, shoots a three, <laughs> drives to the basket, gets fouled, all of a sudden the scrimmage ends up tied. And that's, uh, you know, that was the competitor that John was, even in practice when he could have just said, okay, let's get these two minutes over with, uh, practice will be over. He wanted to try to come back and win that <laughs> scrimmage, and uh, that, he did that all the time. And Larry, the great story, we, we went to Spokane, oh, probably now eight or ten years ago to do some kind of special on John, and the stories that came out of Gonzaga were the summer, mm -hmm. he would play pickup games against high school kids and college players and just local guys and get into fights in the, in the gym at Gonzaga in the summer because just as you said, Jeff, he's not going to lose. I mean, if you put the uniform on, you have an obligation to try and win. Well, let me tell you when, when I realized, uh, I'd heard somebody describe him as the kind of guy who needed to beat his five-year-old kid in ping pong 15 to nothing every time. When I saw that was in that great series we had against the Lakers in 87 or 88 uh, when we were down there. We were down there, I think, for game four or five, and it was an off day because we were playing every other day, and so we were at the pool and they had a papa shot game there and you get one point in the first 15 seconds and two points for each basket made in the in the last 15 seconds and and if, if you score in the low 30s it's pretty tough and 
So they're watching us play a couple of these kids, a couple of kids nearby, and this 12-year-old in a wheelchair comes up. He says, can I play with you guys? And the winner stays on, by the way. So we said, sure. So they put the quarter in and started playing the next game. And, and, and John scored 31. This kid scored 33. John scored 34. So they, it was, they were playing horse. Well, finally, it gets apparent as they're going down the at 15, 20 minutes into this, this kid's going to beat John. So, so he's up blocking this kid's <laughs> shot. And I thought, that guy's got a competitive instinct because John would no sooner embarrass a 12-year-old kid, you know, than fly to the moon. And, and here he is. He can't stand to lose, so he's blocking the kid's shot. Well, it's not just on the floor because uh, as a take-charge guy and a point guard, John believed he had to run everything. And that extends to the domestic side as well. Listen up. We'll be back. Whatever he does, he wants to be the best at it, or at least do give it 110%, like the ad says, but it's so true when it comes to John, because, um, you know, if he's unloading the dishwasher, he'll unload the dishwasher, and then he'll say, you know, Nada, he, he did do this to me one time. He, he, I was gone, he unloaded the dishwasher, and when I came home, he had rearranged the kitchen. He felt the cups should be someplace else, the fork should be switched over in the silverware tray because he felt that there was a better way to do it, a more, a more efficient way to do it. It looks like every guy that you went to school with, you think that was a pretty good guy. And I think that oftentimes the one thing that never comes up is how much ability he has. I always hoped that I'd get one shot at it, that I'd get to try out for a team at some point in time, and I thought that, that my career would be complete at that point. His success on the basketball court, you know, made him notable around the world, basically. But, you know, to us here, he's just a, a very nice man. It's great to see a friend of yours succeed to the level he has and know that he's done it right. In this day and age where we're looking for people to emulate, John is the kind of guy you want to put on a pedestal and say, this is the guy you want to be like. Well, I'll tell you what means more to me in all the basketball in the world is the kind of person he is. The most amazing thing is how he's been able to balance his family in the NBA limelight. The best that ever uh, played the game at, that, at his position. Perfection. You know, he is the Michelangelo of point guards. He makes plays look so easy, but on the other hand, when you have asked some other people to try to do that, that's impossible. There's no question in my mind, if you say one of the top point guards ever play this game, John Stockton's name is going to be there, because uh, uh, he is. I mean, he's proven it. If any guy out there in high school, junior high, wants to play the point guard position, they should try to be like John Stockton. He's a basketball genius. I think in order to do it as long as he's done it and as good as he's done it, you have to be smarter than the next guy. And um, I think that is what, is what has gotten him to the point where he is now. Great player. I mean, a great guy, too. Uh, He's going to be in the Hall of Fame, as everybody know, and, um, you know, uh, I admire him a lot. Uh, I think you know, at the age he is right now and still being in the great shape that he is, uh, that just tell you about something about him and about how, many, how competitive he can be. I feel like it's my job to be ready to play every night, and, and even more than that, I feel like I owe it to my teammates to be ready to play every night. They talk about records that will never be broken. I think John's assist record will never be broken. I don't, I don't think there's a, a chance that will even happen. I'm not sure we'll ever see a guy that has all those attributes, but we hope, it, we hope for the sake of basketball there is, uh, because I think that's what basketball needs, more John Stockton. If a person were going to try to quantify accurately, what John Stockton's meant to the Jazz over his career, it would be an exercise in futility. I think there is no way to measure what John's meant to the Jazz. Welcome back, everybody, to our hour special with uh, looking at the life of John Stockton as a basketball player and as a person as well. And, of course, our panel here, two guys that know him well, good friend Jeff Hornacek and former teammate as well as former opponent, as we pointed out, and owner Larry Miller. Jeff, I want to ask you, part of that was talking about the balancing act between being an NBA player and being a family man, and, and I don't think any of us can really appreciate that balancing act. I know that w the times when I would travel with you guys, you, would, you were constantly calling home. To be centered with your family uh, and, and who you are is very difficult out on the road, but you guys were able to do it, and I sense that you were able to help one another do it as well. Well, it was, 
It was a, a tough thing when you have a family where you, you know when you go back home, there's a lot of demands. You, you need to be with them, spend time with them. You know, feel guilty that you've been on the road and you want to spend a lot of time with them. Uh, when you get on the road, it was, it was probably a benefit, um, strictly because, you're, like you said, you're talking to them on the phone, you're seeing how their day went, what's going on in their classes, and, and keeps you from really boredom or going out and doing something stupid. But, uh, you know, John was, uh, was that type of guy where uh, the same effort he put into basketball, he tried to put in as a father. And, um, you know, a lot of times people might think that was, it was tougher, but it probably actually helps you. It keeps you grounded, uh, keeps you knowing that, hey, I need to go do my job, but then when I get home, i got to spend time with the family. And uh, it's a little bit of a tough balancing act, but, um, you know, John's been able to do it. And now he's going to make that balancing act uh, with uh, retirement, which is not the easiest thing in the world either from guys I've talked to who have gone through it. That requires some balance as well. It's a different side of the coin. More driving duties for him. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's good. Especially Let's, with six kids he's got. That's right. He's going to have to take a lot of them. Place. Well, that's good. He gets uh, frequent driver miles on that one. Larry, you know, when you hear those accolades coming from, I mean, some of the biggest names in the, in the history of the game and uh, around the league, uh, it's just a reinforcement, obviously. And I know from an organizational standpoint, you know, drafting good people, quote unquote, and however nebulous that decision is, but that's something that, you know, you've tried to do. And, uh, you know, when you surround the organization with people like that, you get a lot less problems than some of these other teams have had. Well, absolutely. And we've been very fortunate over the years to have a minimal amount of it. We've had a little bit creep in on the fringes from here and there, but never in one of our key players. And, and John has just epitomized that. And, and that's probably, probably one of the things that scares me about looking to the future. He's, he's set such an example for everybody in the, on the team and in the locker room. You know, who follows John Stockton in that role? You know, Cor Carl and Jeff have been there by, by his side for a number of years, but, uh, but boy, he's, uh, as they've, they said recently, uh, they broke the mold. Uh, after he came along, and so I worry about the future of our team in that regard. We're just going to have to get lucky and find somebody with a lot of character. Well, we talk about the numbers on the floor as well, you know, and, and those numbers have been printed in the newspaper and talked about on television over the last several days. But we tried to put together kind of those highlights of big moments in John's career. So we'll look at those, and then we'll look at the numbers, and they are astounding. Set the screen, stock that quick, hold to Carl. He's under, slam it in with a left hand. Good time, Bo, that's really brilliant. Stockton has been the man here in the fourth quarter. Stock down the middle, left side of Malone, for the layup, score! All right, and here are the look at the numbers uh, together. And, and uh, you know, 15 8 6 but as you said, Larry, the games played with one team, uh, 15 5 4 and 17 complete seasons, not missing a game out of the 19 years that he was, uh, was in the league. I mean, that is astronomical. It is, and I'll tell you another one that I think should be on there that isn't is the, the most, uh, it's got, he's got uh, 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 nine years, as career assist leader, but in the history of the NBA, I think there are eight seasons where people had a thousand. Isaiah Thomas had a thousand one year. Kevin Porter, not Kevin Porter, but for somebody for Philly, I think had uh, maybe it was Kevin Porter had a thousand once, and John six times, and <laughs> and uh, and that and one of those years I think in '92 he averaged 14.5 or 14 point assists, uh, 14.6 assists a game. I I mean there's just so many numbers. Where do you start? Where do you stop? It, it just, again, it's tough to quantify. Let's talk about the finals years, 97-98. First time, obviously, the shot uh, to get the Jazz to the, uh, to the finals. But, uh, you know, that first final series with the Bulls, pretty rarefied air, Michael Jordan. And in game four in particular, a game that, uh, you know, everybody thought the Jazz were going to lose, we've got to look at, I think, three big plays from that, from that game that show John Stockton and the versatility of John Stockton, the kind of things that he was able to do, um, and you guys did as a team. You know, from the individual to the assist side of things. I mean, I remember being here during that night, and it was one of the one of the all-time most electrifying nights in sports. But Jeff, this kind of got you guys started, and uh, you know, you watch this, and then I think there is the uh, I think there's the the touchdown pass as it's been dubbed right here. I like his reaction when he. Let's see if they show it here. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the few times that people said, "Does he ever smile?" Right. Can you talk to me about those, about 
the emotion of, of those two series, Jeff? Well, you know, it was the first time for all of us to be in the finals, so um, it was a time when we were all excited to be there. Um, I think the first time around, we expected to win, we wanted to win. Um, when it was all over with, we said they were the better team. But not the second year. Uh, the second year was tough. Uh, we felt we were the better team. Uh, you know, we can go back and look at the layoff that, that probably hurt us. Uh, that, I think we had 10 days off before that, uh, that series. And we played, we played well, but uh, we weren't as sharp as we were before that. So that was a tough year to take. But uh, uh, we had some good runs at it. And John, John obviously was a big part of that with all the big plays that he made. Well, these guys were the big three, Larry, with John and Carl and Jeff. But from a franchise standpoint, that first year, as an owner, because you've been through it uh, for, what, 10 or 12 years at that point in time, right. and uh, you finally get to the top of the mountain, um, you know, it had to be rewarding. And to see the guys who had been there since the start. Exactly. It really was. And to, to try every year to say, okay, now we've got to fill this hole or build on this. And, and then to get there, get to the finals, uh, and especially the two years in a row. Uh, obviously, the Bulls were a great team, but as Jeff said, we did think in 98 we had the better team and, and still couldn't pull it off. So that was a disappointment, but what a great ride it was those two years. Well, it certainly was a great team moment, but how about the greatest individual moment and team moment in jazz history? When we return, we'll show you that as we go to break. Some other great moments from the career of John Stockton. Streak off of here and go down the side. They do. Stock's got it. He's got running room. Stockton, dive, hang it up. It's good. It's good. The jazz win it. The Jazz win it! I can't believe it! The Jazz win it! An unbelievable finish! Well, here we go. Final two seconds. Stockton on the turn for the win! Oh, my. Russell looking. Russell inbounds to Stockton a bit more. But on the screen. Stockton goes right side. He's open. He'll take it for 20. Got it! Stockton! Hits it! Jazz take the lead! Seven-tenths of one second left in the game. John Stockton. Welcome back to our John Stockton special, everybody. To fans, players, coaches, owner, everybody associated with the Utah Jazz franchise, it is simply known as the shot. And we had a great comeback. Stockton, three on two, keeps it. That whole last four minutes or five minutes of that fourth quarter were so improbable. And Stockton has been the man here in the fourth quarter. Everything came together. What's at stake? The Utah Jazz, if they can pull out a victory here, go to the NBA Finals for the first time. We had a full house in here, as a matter of fact, and uh, Jack was watching it down at the house. And this place was packed, and I went home so I could watch it because everybody's talking. So I went home and I was sitting in the living room when he shot it all by myself. All I saw of that game was probably the last minute. I had the same play we, we ran all the time. So guys want to shot uh, in those situations, uh, usually can step up and make them. You know, I'm sure that's what every kid in the world dreams about doing that one time. You know? So it was no different for John, I'm sure. Russell will inbound at half court. I was in the, the corner in front of the bench there and when I saw him with the ball and no one near him, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Well, I was sitting on the bench, so I got a good view of it. When it left his hands, I just got up and started walking to the locker room. I just knew. I mean, I knew the guy was going to make it because he's just ice. When he hit that shot, we all screamed so loud that we woke up everybody. <laughs> I just went bonkers, and I came down the alley here, which is two blocks, and people were standing up that they knew I'd be coming. And uh, they were, God, it was, it was great. It was really that was a big thrill for me. We have never seen this kind of emotion from Stockton <laughs> and Malone. And finally, their day has come. He was acting like a little kid. He jumped up and down. He was, had his fist clenched, and he was just jumping up and down. He was the happiest guy in the world. It was so much fun just seeing him hit that. And when he started you know, jumping up and down, we thought, hey, we can do it too. He made that shot. I was running around the house crazy. <laughs> I was running all over the house. <laughs> doing what he did and everything. It was a special day. Uh, you don't see him showing any emotion on the court, and that one was something else. That was so many things all wrapped up into one. It was, it was our first chance to go to the championship. It was really the first time we'd been able to beat Houston at anything. I've never really gotten over my first year I got traded to Houston, and he had to shout over me to, to send the Jazz to the finals. It was just a terrific shot. And what a great moment for the Utah franchise. Their proudest moment ever. It's got to be 
the greatest uh, shot in jazz history in terms of what it meant to the team. First of all, I want to know if you can still jump like that, okay? After a few years off, yeah, I can <laughs> The still knees know. are still okay. <laughs> Probably not as high as that, though. Talk to me about what went on in that huddle um, right before that and then, and then immediately after. I mean, we saw the joy. If, if there's a definition of joy, the picture ought to be that group because that had to be, I think, uh, you know, one of the, most, the greatest examples of it. What happened before that? Well, I think the good thing is the game was already tied, and we knew that uh, uh, if we run the play, uh, it's the same play, like I said, on the, on the tape, that's the same play we always run. And uh, Carl just set that little pick, and, and that was a smart play on Carl's part because at that point of the game, they don't want to call a moving screen. And he took advantage of that, got Clyde off him, and, and um, I don't know, on the video you can kind of tell when I saw John, the ball leave his hand, I was already starting to motion that direction because... Uh, from my position of, of seeing the ball in the rim, it looked good to me. <laughs> and so uh, uh, it was just a, a play we always ran. We just executed well. John made the shot, and off we go to the finals. <laughs> and Larry, where were you? You said you, you didn't see this game. Nope. Uh, Gail and I were in, a, in our car just driving around. We were in Salt Lake and, and <clears throat> turned the radio on, and we were down quite a ways at, between the third and fourth quarters, I recall, and then didn't gain too much till I don't know four or five minutes to go in the game. It was just an incredible run, and <clears throat> when he hit it, uh, of course we were doing the same thing, hollering and shouting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one thing Carl adds to this, by the way, is that he says in the huddle when the play was called, he said, "Now, John, take your time and get the shot. I promise you'll be open." And then you see, if you watch what he did to Drexler, I mean, this, as Jeff said, they cut him more than just a little slack. He he, he latched onto Drexler and took him 15, 20 feet away from the shot. It was great. Well, it was over a former teammate of you. And, you know, we all love Charles, but, you know, there was, a certain, there was a certain symmetry there, too, for that. Well, you know, Charles was on Carl, so I'm, he didn't want to leave Carl. And then all of a sudden he saw John was wide open. He had to run over there and be the guy that uh, got, the, got the basket made over. But, uh, um, you know, it's just exciting for all of us to go through that. And I think the biggest thing was we've been striving for that point to get to the final. So, um, so like you said, it was the shot. It's ironic that uh, the biggest shot in jazz history, as characterized by Larry Miller, would come in the inverse of John Stockton and Carl Malone because John was the, uh, was the shooter in this case and Carl was the one who set the pick. But Stockton and Carl Malone, obviously two of the greatest to ever play the game of basketball, and for 18 years they defined the Utah Jazz. The style? Well, it was simple but basically unstoppable, especially when they ran the pick and roll. Stock to the below. <laughs> you got to be able to say it like it's one word. You know? Hammer dunk, stock to the below. At their ever loving best. You can't really talk about one in basketball without the other one. What a wonderful combination. John getting pick and rolls from the best power forward in the history of basketball. Oh, do they do it well? They do it the best of anybody I have ever seen. They've been doing it for, what, about 19 years, and they're still the best in basketball at running a pick and roll. Nobody probably in the history of basketball has run the pick and roll like uh, John and Carl Malone. It's amazing to watch, especially after all these years when people have seen them do it and still can't stop it. They still are killing people with the pick and roll. Scoop it up here. Pick and roll, Carl Malone. But what a deadly weapon. I mean, it's, it's like the sky hook. It's, you know, it's one of a kind. Stop paying them two guys that's capable of winning games by themselves. That's at any age. They the greatest green roll players I've ever seen in, in, in the game. In terms of a twosome, they, they probably have complimented themselves about as well as any two people. Carl brings the, the brute strength, the force, and John, uh, the savvy, the passing, the shooting. Those two are lucky to have had the opportunity to play with each other for so long. They're both very blessed that they got a chance to play with each other. They're two guys who, uh, you know, I talk about how they make other players better. They made each other better. I always, like, resented Carl Malone for getting to play with a point guard that good. Because that's all you really want. If you're going to run the floor, like Carl, who's terrific, run the floor every play, you know you're going to get the ball. One of the great things about Carl Malone is that he might be the best running forward that has ever played the game. And one of the reasons he's such a great running forward is he plays with a point guard 
will always give the ball up. These guys aren't just playing the game right now. These guys are leading the league in categories. They are continuing to dominate basketball games at this late age, and uh, that's what impresses me more than anything else. People talk about Ian Malone being in the league so many years, but that's okay because they're farther ahead in knowledge of the game and how to play the game than many players ever will be. The Stockton Malone contribution to the Utah Jazz. I mean, it's just second to nothing in the major sports. It's just a great story. These guys have played together for so many years and stayed healthy. And no matter who their teammates are, these guys have kept this franchise at the top. Which begs the question, uh, is there life uh, beyond for the singles? And it's going to be difficult to... Uh, First of all, let's, uh, we don't know what Carl is going to do. Um, he's going to continue to play, obviously, he says. But let's talk about John. Jeff, you've gone through, uh, you've gone through retirement. Uh, you know John as well as anybody does. Uh, what does he do? Well, uh, first thing is he'll get away from it a little bit. Uh, um, the thing is, when you quit playing, you're, you're always itching to get back out there and play. And uh, I don't know if you'd see John at too many games because he'll be going, I want to get out there. I want to get out on the court. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, when you retire, you take a little time to get away from it, uh, uh, give yourself a little break. And then, you know, with John, as, as smart as he is with, with the game of basketball and his love for the game, you'll probably see him uh, doing some sort of coaching. Uh, again, what level, who knows, but uh, he'll definitely be involved with the game. I, I would imagine, you know, Larry Bird said it was so hard for him to coach because he expected a certain level of performance. You're in the same boat, too. John is in the same boat. How difficult would that be to go from playing at that level? Because John played still at a high level this year, and then to step into coaching. Do you need that buffer time to be able to forget it, or do you get better as your memory gets worse? Well, um, I think you need a little time, and, and I think you're right uh, with John and, and the way he approached the game, uh, the way he prepared for games, and the way he played it. Uh, it probably would be tough to coach. You know, that's probably with Jerry. You know, Jerry was the same way. You know, he played it as hard as he can, and, you know, nowadays you don't get all 12 players playing like that, and, and I'm sure it would drive, drive him crazy, but uh, I'm sure he would uh, uh, be able to adjust a little bit and, and maybe put a little to the side. And uh, like you said, if you had a few years off, maybe you, maybe you realize the way the game has changed and that, you know, perfect picture is all guys play like that, but it's not going to happen and, and he'd adjust. Larry, the question I've been asked uh, along with what's Carl going to do and, and were you surprised, the number one question that I'm asked beyond that is, what are the Jazz going to do? When's John Stockton night? What's going to happen? Um, you've obviously had a chance to think about it. I said today on the radio show, it's going to depend on what John does because uh, the leverage is going to have to twist his arm to do anything. <laughs> but but what, what are the thoughts right now? Well, we're actually meeting tomorrow to try to really formulate what we try to do to uh, tie all this up and put a ribbon on it. I, I mean, John knows he can't just walk away the way he did in the interview in the locker room. Uh, that, and he did that because he was starting to get emotional, and, and there's got to be closure for the fans and for John and for, and for his family. So, so we don't know yet. I, the challenge is at the Delta Center, we've got 20,000 seats, but if we say, community, come and celebrate the end of John's career, how many people come? It's more than 20,000, <laughs> so where do you put the other 180,000 or 280,000? We thought about, I thought about calling my friend Chris Hill up at the University of Utah and saying, Chris, can we use your stadium? So you got 50,000, 55,000 people up there. What do you do with the other 150 or whatever? So I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tall order on that regard. The other side, if they're talking about replacing John on the team, I mean, how would you like to be John Stockton's replacement and, and have him as a measuring stick? It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I'd like him to be living in Spokane if I were doing it or yeah, maybe uh, further yeah. away. I, I will say that I think we've got a couple of very good young point guards in Raul Lopez and Carlos Arroyo and, and I think that we as a, as a team and the fans ought not to sell them short uh, clearly they're inexperienced but we all we know for sure now we're in the rebuilding mode so so we probably have some time and need to be a little bit patient in terms of what we expect although on this team we've always liked three point guards so uh, obviously I have to be careful what I say about free agents <laughs> at this juncture but uh, but there's two of our three, so we'll just have to stay tuned on that one. So we should look for uh, some time in the, uh, at least in the summer, maybe uh, something solidified in terms of what's going to happen with uh, 
uh, with some kind of a tribute or a John Stockton night or whatever. Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, Steve, I appreciate you asking that question because I think it's something that it's time maybe now that we ought to do this pretty soon while it's on everybody's mind. And, of course, it's been a huge emotional experience for, for much of our community in our state, uh, and it is right now. And, and I think it, to have it, I'm going to say, hanging over John uh, as an open-ended item would be difficult for him too. So I think we'd want to try to work towards doing something sooner than later. All right, Jeff, Larry, thanks for being with us. Thanks to you at home for joining us. We hope you've learned a little more about John Stockton. We've certainly enjoyed watching him over 19 years, and uh, next week, more John Stockton. This is the longest retirement in history. Good night, everybody. And thank you, Utah Jazz, for the co-MVPs of this year's All-Star Game, Paul Malone and John Stockton. Stockton with a ball front court left. He looks to Carl Malone. He's got him low. The mailman jumps it. Shot it. It's in. He did it. He did it. John Stockton to Carl Malone. Go on their feet. A new NBA assist team. Fox inside low left. Eric Williams. Stockton steals. There it is. Stockton stole the ball. He's the all-time leader in the history of the game. I think I'm finished. So uh, that's uh, I, I, told, I informed those guys, and, and that's the direction I'm headed. So. The Utah Jazz select John Stockton of Gonzaga University. He did it, John Stockton. A new NBA assist king. The crowd going crazy. John Stockton sends the Utah Jazz to the NBA Finals. John Stockton, stealing time, passing history. On May 2nd, 2003,